Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. It is a pleasure to be today with Laura Mielli. Laura, you're the COO of Electronic Arts. You're also on the CEO Next list. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you, Diane. It's great to be here. So you are now a year and a half into this role. What uh, what would you say that you've changed? What impact uh, do you feel you've had since you've come to it? Oh, gosh, great question. And it's it's gone by in a snap. It's gone by so fast this year and a half. Um, one of my one of the my favorite parts about the responsibility and COO roles can be defined in different ways for different companies, but my the favorite my favorite combination is that I'm responsible for setting the strategy for the company, mm-hmm. creating the operational plan, and then the execution. And to have all of that connected and be able to pull that thread through of seeing where we where we're going in three to five years, creating the right operational plan partnering with our creative partners and the incredible thousands of employees of electronic arts to see that executed day to day has been um, a really gratifying connected experience. I've been with the company for 27 years. I've had many roles here. And so, and all roads have led, led to me connecting these dots and our teams together to collaborate, to realize the potential of our strategy. So that's been fun. It's been a fun um, moment to um, connect with the teams that I know so well and to um, see us reach even greater potential. One of the things that um, for as long as I've known EDA, it's been a juggernaut in in the gaming space. And to be the market leader in many ways, um, it, it's how do you keep yourself sort of hungry and ahead of the curve and innovating when um, in many cases you're the biggest kid on the block? Yes. That is a great question. The innovator's dilemma, right? Right. Um, you can be so successful, and how do you disrupt yourself to um, to change um, your your trajectory? I think it's what I have found the leaders at EA and myself especially is that um, to be successful in the industry, you have to be almost a moth to the flame around chaos and change and innovation, and and really get energy from that. Mm-hmm. And I've seen people come in that can be fatigued by that, and then. The people that are leading the company, setting the tone for thinking and rethinking and reinventing games and showing up for our players are people that thrive in, okay, let's shake it up. We did this last year. We did this last time. How will it look um, as we move forward? The other really important component is being very connected to our players. Mm-hmm. And, um, and and I, I know that people use the learning mindset a lot um, in business now, but it really is true. And, and having um, an expansive mindset and being open to learning and understanding how we can show up for players, what their expectations are, particularly as generations change and our gener- generations are changing quite a bit. Um, we know from millennials to Gen Z to Gen Alpha, there's a lot of differences. Oh, there. wait, there's a Gen Alpha. That's news to me. I thought I thought we were still on Gen Z. Now we've moved on to the <laughs> there next is, crop. There's a new one coming. The toddlers. <laughs> well, well, let's ask about the the generations because I am curious. Um, as you're listening to the players, what is changing? Let's let's take Gen Z. I'm the mother of uh, three of them. How are they different than how millennials approach gaming? What we what we are finding is the combination of creation, self expression connected with social engagement and social connection is something very powerful and meaningful for um, Gen Z. And so as we think about our big franchises that we have, our FIFA franchise, which will soon be EA Sports FC, Mm -hmm. our Sims franchise, our Battlefield franchise, our Apex franchises, the idea that we would bring and expand modalities of play and, and, and to create and to connect and to watch together is very powerful for us to meet Gen Z where their motivations and needs are. And that is somewhat different than Gen X millennial um, gameplay style. So we're seeing this connection of they want to play, they want to create, they want to have agency over their experience. They want to watch other people's gameplay footage and then they want to connect socially. So it's more than just multiplayer. I, I want to let, let's um before I go back, so I want to, you're, you've had a fascinating career. I've just uh, been watching The Last of Us. You know, we've had the mm-hmm. season finale. I've been intrigued by this um, shift that we've seen in really games coming to TV versus the other way around. What What do you think's going on there? First of all, did you see it? <laughs> did you watch it? Yes, I have. We've been um, glued to it. It's it's one wonderfully executed. 
um, there, there's, there's been some phenomenal um, shows from games um, that have come out in the last um, couple of years that I'm incredibly impressed with. And again, I've been doing this for a long time to see this all come full circle when, you know, 27 years ago, we were begging Hollywood to um, license their IP to break, to make games out of um, movies and TV series. And so to come full circle and for um, the, you know, streaming leaders and Hollywood to be so interested in our characters, our worlds, our stories that we tell um, is a, is a great full circle moment. And I think it's just the beginning. Uh, I think that there there is the opportunity for some interactivity with content. There is opportunity for people to socially connect around what we create and have shared experiences around um, the storytelling and around um, having perhaps virtual water cooler moments. Um, so I, I think that we're in the early stages and it's something that is um, fascinating to see um, roll out. And, and I love I love that um, the, 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 the quality of the content is so high and, and that we get to show the world about these beautiful worlds we create and these deep characters and these wonderful stories. Let's go back 27 years. Um, what brought you into the industry in the first place? Were you a gamer yourself? Yes, I have been. Um, yes, I have loved games my entire life. Um, I, I grew up in a, in a very small town in Lake Tahoe called Incline Village. Mm -hmm. And my town was my town was so small that we didn't even have mail delivery. We had to go to the post office every day and we would see, you know, three or four friends we'd run into every time we go to the post office. Yeah. And I um, and I also was very motivated to organize our neighbors and fr and, and family around game nights. And I, I really loved the, I, the social connection and that shared experience of competing and playing a game together. I was it was a high motivation for me. So then 27 years ago, I was working in architectural firms and I was contacted by a friend of a friend about a game company that was looking for a product manager to come run their online community, Westwood Online. Mm -hmm. and at the time, it was a million people, which seemed gigantic to me. It was over 100 times the size of my little small town that yeah. I grew up in. And so the idea that I could organize and curate and oversee and help enable gameplay game matches across a million people was fascinating to me and so i immediately jumped at the opportunity and then here i am today you know um with, with electronic arts and we have over 650 million player accounts in our network well of um, course is, you know over almost twice the size of the us and so it's 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 incredible and the idea that i had a career in creating games and enabling these social connections for people to have these shared experiences and to entertain them is phenomenal. And people don't even have to go to the post office to connect. <laughs> socially well, games what's like. interesting that that million people that you had back then, uh, I, I don't know what the demographics were, but certainly we've seen a lot of debates over the years over the portrayal of women, um, you know, incorporating uh, women as players, but also characters. I know that you have, by virtue of um, your profile and, and probably your interest, been involved in these debates. What was it like then? And what do you think have been some of the key changes that have made gaming more inclusive? Mm -hmm. Gosh, great question. And one of my favorite subjects. Um, yes, yes. 27 years ago, um, I was often the only woman in many meetings and in and, um, and, and many of our um, you know offices for sure. Um, but it's but it has evolved quite a bit. And I think that um, women have a huge interest in gaming. There are over 3 billion gamers in the world and half of them are women. And so the idea that we would have an industry that is primarily comprised of men creating content for the world in which we live in um, we just knew we had to evolve and and make changes. And I, you know, today, fast forward to today, 50% of my leadership team are women. And many of those women have 50% of their leadership team as women. And so I, I just have been highly motivated to bring the voice of women and to diversify and have inclusion um, in our teams, how we think about things. Um, and I also passionately believe that when you do that, the content that you create and the content that you put out in the world will represent the player base in which we're creating games for. So, you know, I, and I, I, my advice to people is the, it seems like a, sometimes these obstacles or the opportunities seem so vast and you just don't know where to start. I just believe a, you have to model the behavior and just get, just get started somewhere. And, um, and I've, I've been working on this for many, many years. And again, here we are 50% of my leadership team are women and you just chip away at it as you go year after year. How are you feeling about the content? Cause it is aspirational and you can't crowdsource, um, you can't crowdsource stories or, or excellence or characters always uh, often it's, you know, it's the creative genius of the 
creator. Do you have favorite characters yourself that you think might not have, um, you know, existed 27 years ago, given the the perceived demographic of the population back then? I just I'd love to get some sense from you as to how the actual, you know, the meat and potatoes of the product has shifted. Yes, I, I, that's a great that's I love that question. And um, Gina Davis has been a, a pretty significant mentor and um, an example, I think, and how to she's bring... going to make you run for office if that's the case, because <laughs> she she loves getting women into politics. So, but... <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Thank you for the warning. <laughs> um, but she has just done a phenomenal job creating frameworks. And I um, used her inspiration to create an inclusion framework for our company. And what I what I believe about a creative culture and, and being a leader of creative people. It's not about being directive or prescriptive. It's about expanding and, and creating awareness and intentionality about mm. what we create. And this framework that we created, again, was very much inspired by what she did for TV and movies. And it was to raise awareness. It was a, to raise awareness around, I want you to be aware that um, the number of lines of a of dialogue that are being spoken by women or underrepresented, um, t- you know, talent or underrepresented people in our games, and that our designers and storytellers can be intentional and deliberate about the content they're putting in, out in the world. And I just I believe so much in the values and principles of the team members that work here that I felt like if we had that, if they had awareness and we had framework and they had tools that they could use to evaluate and assess the content they're putting out in the world, that they would do the right thing and that they would have the right balance and that they would create the content that they would that they want consumed um, by the world and so we created that about um six years ago and since then we have an entire um, positive play group that's dedicated to inclusive content safe communities and um and and reducing toxicity for women and again underrepresented people in the world in our game experiences so it it was one of those things that started small and just scaled and again this is the chip away at the um, opportunity Um, and it's something that has resulted i i believe in quite diverse content we have we've had you know some of the first we were the first in sports to bring women's teams into our games Mm -hmm. and we have had some amazing female um, pro- uh, and protagonist in our games, such as our Star Wars Jedi, uh, Star Wars Battlefront game. Um, so I'm I'm really proud of what this work and this framework has resulted in in the content and the and the sports, as you said, sort of creating some you know actual sports around it. I, let, talk about some of the pivot points in your career, um, you know, good and bad. But what do you think when you think about what really took you to the next level at some key moments? What comes to mind? Oh gosh, I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, early in early in my career and early in many people's career, and particularly when you're underrepresented, I felt the need to prove myself and be an expert and show up with the answers. And I found myself, you know, and I and I got a lot. I had a lot of success from doing that and working really hard, digging deep, being intellectually curious, and um, and 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 you know, educating people, making people smarter in a in a meeting kind of thing. And the the biggest pivot point was a just a wonderful piece of advice and and coaching that I had received from a coach I was working with mm-hmm. actually, and and it really opened up my ability to be a scaled leader. And and the advice was to be more invested in other people's success than your own. And if you can show up and stare someone in their face, see them, meet them where they are and be genuinely invested in them succeeding. And if more people did that, the multiplier effect of it and the flow of that is something very powerful. And and it was, it was a pretty significant turning point for me. And it took me, admittedly, I will tell you, (laughs) it took me about better, the better part of a year to really process that and really live that value. It wasn't, you know, some people are easier than others to sit across the table from and say, I'm very invested in your Well, success. it's interesting because like what does it look like? In, in a sense, you still have to be, you're the boss. Um, yeah. It is difficult to do. I, I, I'm i intrigued by the fact that you had a coach. I remember being at an event, uh, it was a women's event. And when I asked in the room, first of all, how many people had gone to, you know, some aspect of all female education a lot of hands went up. When I asked how many people had an executive coach, almost all the hands went up. Very few people watching this will have an executive coach. At what point in your career did you get one? And how did you get one? Did you ask or did they assign 
one to you saying, Laura, we see great things for you and here's your coach? Oh gosh, great question. I mean, I, I've, I've, gen- I've generally always raised my hand for development. And so um, I have sought out um, coaching and, um, and, and self development and improvement for sure. Um, and I would, and I early on, and I, I've had many coaches that have served me in um, different, with, with different needs and for different purposes mm. in my career. Early on, it was perhaps more mechanical, where I needed to work on time management and um, how to organize a process. To, you know, even recently, it's 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 really around um, how you show up as a leader, how you show up as a human being for the creative people that you want to lead and enable. And so, um, you know, some of the work I've done in the recent years has really been around um, personal development because as a leader, you show up as a whole person and you need to live an examined life, I believe, to Mm -hmm. be an effective leader. And I have a, a, I have a very expansive (laughs) learning mindset and intellectual curiosity. And it's something that deeply motivates me and fulfills me. So I'm I'm very lucky that um, my company in Electronic Arts has always supported me in doing that um, because I get a lot from it and a lot of energy um, from that. And I, you know, I really believe that if you show up in a room and you're the expert and you do all the talking, you you have so few options really. And when you work with incredibly intelligent, motivated, inspired, creative people, you always I always want the the, the, the feedback and the energy and that collaboration to happen. And, and I think that to do that as a leader, you, you have to be very self-aware. And to your point, you're right. As a leader, at some point, you have to make decisions, set direction, set strategy, help create the framework for people. And I always seek to do that in the most informed way I possibly can. The, coaching has really helped me. The that. higher up you go, the, the more you do delegate. I'm, I'm curious, uh, we, we talk about pivot points almost in the abstract when you think about sort of your core, this does sound like a therapy session. When you think about like your, your core <laughs> strengths as a leader um, that you feel you've developed that have really helped you, what would you point to? I mean, I'm assuming being driven is certainly one, being curious. What what do you think has propelled you really to, you know, grow in this one company, is, but grow as a leader in the industry too? My, my belief in the human potential of our creative leaders and people around us have, has really propelled me to evolve my leadership approach. I love the idea of lifting people up, inspiring them, putting a superhero cape on them and letting them have career defining experiences here. Now that said, I, I take leadership very and accountability very seriously. And the way that I show up with our teams is I have I speak with conviction and passion about ideas and and their and, and and possibilities, but I hold them loosely. And the idea that um, people feel like they are supported and that ideas are theirs or that they're ours together collectively is far more important to me than being the one person in the room. You can never be smarter than the creative collective in your organization. So, really deeply considering the scale and the power and the potential of the people in your organization will surprise you and help you all realize potential that you didn't think possible and wouldn't be possible on your own. On the strategy side, it's a people business. It's also a technology business. How is technology shaping uh, not just, uh, well, let's just ask how it's, because there's been a lot of discussion around with the advances in AI, the degree to which that is shaping the creative space as well. How are you thinking about it? Well, it's an incredibly exciting time, um, definitely. Um, and I, I, I really consider Electronic Arts an entertainment creative company at our core, but we are absolutely enabled by technology. It is a, a significant foundation, an enabler and accelerator for us um, that we have a deep respect and, um, and a lot of investment and spend a lot of time um, talking about and, and investing in. Um, The AI has been a phenomenal um, subject, and I love the awareness, and I love the excitement and energy around it um, today in the world. And it's something we've been working on and working with for decades, as Mm -hmm. you can imagine. We we have AI in our games, and we use AI for a lot of tools um, and enablement in in our development processes. Um, There's a lot of talk right now about generative AI, and there are clear paths and, um, and, and obvious conclusions around what that will do for content creation 
accelerating that, bringing, allowing people to have agency and impact on creative and content that they're working with. And it's getting a lot of sunshine, that subject. Too and much and so? Do you so think it's, it's uh, we're over-indexing on it and over-hyping it? Um, I think, I, I no, I, I don't know if it's over-hyping. I think it's an exciting space, definitely. Um, and for us, there are a lot of other areas as well that machine learning and AI will be um, incredibly meaningful for us. I think the notion around um, improving player experiences, improving our developer experiences is incredibly important to us. Um, we, we use AI and machine learning today in creating safer communities. Um, we have things like toxic image detection, anti-cheating. Um, we detect bad um, anti-cheating on games. Communication. I'm sorry. Anti-cheating on games. You can tell the people yes. who are cheating on the games. Yes. Yes. It's almost like cheating with yourself, isn't it? I guess. But well, not really. I mean, they they cheat with others. That's true. That's <laughs> true. On the competitions, you're absolutely right. An unfair you know, advantage, and so we have to watch for that. You you have, I I know this because I've talked to a lot of recruiters, and your name comes up. So you must get calls offering other opportunities. It's unusual to stay 27 years in an industry, in a company, excuse me. Um, what has kept you there? I mean, it's one of the pieces of advice that people often get is move around. Um, so you didn't, I guess you did follow that prior, but what kept you there and, and what made you feel like that this was a big enough palette to build a career on? Mm-hmm. Yes, I mean, the, 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 well, we've talked a lot about the evolution, innovation, and the exciting changes that happen in gaming. And you think about where gaming was 27 years ago to where it is today, it has radically changed. And I can honestly, hand on heart, tell you that none of my two days in the last 27 years have ever been the same. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I am quite um, I, energized by the innovation, the change, the evolution of technology and game and media and entertainment. And so it feels, it does not feel like I've been at the exact same company um, for 27 years, first of all. And so the the notion of fast, rapid change is, is exciting. And I've had the privilege of having many different roles here. Um, again, my intellectual curiosity and learning mindset um, helps me um, come into opportunities in the company from data and analytics to leading marketing organizations. I was the general manager over our Star Wars business for a while, which was incredibly fun. Yeah. And then in recent years, I've come into more scaled leadership roles where it has been less about the work itself and more about leading people at um, in a scaled way and inspiring people and, and again, in, inspiring and motivating collaboration and creative connection across the company, which has been incredibly gratifying. So every role has had its own challenges, opportunities, and gratification for me um, that have been very different from one role to the other. Do you mind if I pivot back a second? So, for some reason, I'm suddenly getting visions of, of me doing Dungeons and Dragons in high school. So we'll put that aside. But I, I want to ask just a little more about your personal life. Um, growing up in this small town, who or what inspired you? You know, even within your own family, because does it like get me out of this town that inspired you? Or was there anything else you'd think about that really just shaped you as a person? I think the the small town um, connection to human beings was um, an incredibly important uh, aspect and dimension of what of, of how I grew up. And I and I didn't and I didn't realize it until later years. Mm. Um, my parents owned local businesses. The I, I grew up. I went to elementary, middle, and high school in this small town, and so I grew up with kids that were family to me. And to look back on it, um, you know, my my dad had friends that would see me maybe misbehaving, you know, and, and they, they would tell him. And so just this interconnection and human connection was um, an incredibly important foundation um, for me. And I, it's something that I have, that I believe in. It's something that I um, am motivated by and look to um, connect people. Um, I'm, I'm a connector mm -hmm. and, and love people coming together to be there through opportunities, through challenges, to have experiences together. And so it's um, it was it was a, a fundamental um, you know, foundation forming experience living in this small town. So now I want to pivot to the future to, and talk about what's around the corner in terms of some of the, you know, things that excite you both at EA and beyond in the industry. You know, 
Um, it is a space where we see a lot of innovation. What's next in terms of even the disruptions that you feel are going to make us think differently and see, you know, a lot of different content three to five years from now? I'm not sure what the right timeline is. You pick it. Mm -hmm. I think three to five years is a great timeline. Um, we we recently hit a, an incredible milestone um, in gaming. We have over three billion gamers, um, you know, playing games around the world, which is significant, and it's only going to get larger. So we we anticipate that you know close to doubling in the next five years. Um, Wait, that would well. be the whole planet, wouldn't about, it? Almost the whole planet yes. if you double from three. We will not, we will not stop until everyone's <laughs> a gamer on the planet. Um, the yes, and the you know these current generations are growing up on games. Gaming is their preferred entertainment over TV, over music, over movies. And so you're, you're, we're going to see this emergence of people in the world influencing entertainment. And it is about um, playing a game. It is about creating um, content together. It is about watching content, sharing content, creative self-expression. It's about the social engagement and social connection around those experiences. And that's going to evolve and that's incredibly exciting. And we're really in the earliest stages and earliest days of the meaning of that um, when you think about games now we have a game you know our fifa game um which will be ea sports fc you mm -hmm. know this year we're launching um the it, it you, you have people that come in at, at for free in some of our game experiences they come in and play mobile they have these high def experiences and to have that huge ecosystem and, and you know hundreds of millions of players that have exposure to this game experience to connect them socially, to connect platforms that they play, to connect the um, gratification achievements, the currency that they play. That That's the road ahead. That's the opportunity for us. And we have many franchises that this will happen with. You know, our Sims franchise is just this beautiful creative expression, create content, share content, um, support each other, um, lift each other up and share, create, you know, the, the houses that they're building. Yeah. And create the offline experience, too, because I noticed that with Gen Z, they want to be turning off, you know, the computers and meeting in person. And I know that you've facilitated some of that. Um, let's end with some advice. You know, I not, uh, you know, the 60s, you know, plastics, Benjamin plastics. Like, what is your advice to people who are, you know, whether they're coming out of college or they're they're you know, building their career, which you can do it at any age. Any thoughts as to when people um, that you would say to them that worked well for you? Oh, I love that question. Um, I have so much hope and optimism about these new generations um, coming to the world. Um, some of the some of the worst advice, and I'll share with you the worst advice and best advice I received. And some of the worst advice was to adapt and to um, not make waves and um, to go with the flow of a culture and organization. The greatest advice that I've received and that I want to share with people is be fearless. Believe in your capabilities, believe in your values and your principles, and know that the opportunities will present themselves and reveal themselves. The, um, the World Economic Forum had talked about um, that in five years from now, the majority of jobs that people will have don't even exist today. And so when you walk into opportunities, be fearless about what is being, re what, what reveals itself to you and what opportunities you can possibly connect to. And it will result in things that don't, that, that, that you don't even know are possible. So having, don't, don't over adapt, don't compromise what your values or principles are. Be fearless, jump in, take the opportunity on. You may not know it all. You may not have all the answers and you may not have the experience but believe in yourself and believe that you can learn along the way with a great learning mindset, intellectual curiosity, and uh, approaching an opportunity um, with optimism and belief that it's going to be successful. Great. And I, I would be remiss. I know every, uh, you know, child is sacred. You have two and, and um, all of your characters are sacred. Do you have a favorite one or one that you especially relate to? If, if you were to be a character in a game, one of your games, would there be one that you think, yes, that would be me? Or you'd like it to be you? Oh gosh, that's a great question. I I think I would gravitate more towards um, our our female athletes. Um, I am incredibly inspired and motivated by their power. Um, we have we, we've worked with Megan Rapino as an example, and I I just love how they show up in the world, and they deeply inspire and motivate me to be strong, to continue to chip away, and to continue to stay committed to 
the platform of diversity inclusion and um and just and, and not giving and up. And in, in um, Megan's and case of course equal pay, right? For women's soccer, she's been yes. at the forefront yes. of that. Good. Well, then I'm going to start thinking of Megan Rapino and you in the same sentence, Laura. Thank you oh for joining us <laughs> and um, great advice. Appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Diane. Thanks.